why does everyone hold Percy Jackson accountable in a way they don't anyone else? Why does Calypso and Leo yell at Percy more than anyone else? It's something you can't help but notice. What is the explanation? The explanation is that Percy Jackson is the scapegoat. Rick Riordan created a world that shows how people would react and how they would feel if the Greek and Roman and Nordic and Egyptian, for that matter, gods were real. If you read these myths and you actually lived those lives, how would you react? How would you feel if Zeus was actually your uncle? The only way to explain parents who ignore you your entire life, some who don't even tell the mortal parent they had you with that they are a god, and leaving the kids to be attacked by monsters, not because of anything the kids did, but because the monsters are trying to get back at their parents and they're the easiest source for that, even though those kids don't know their parents, have never met them before a lot of the time, is to categorize them as abusive parents. The Greek and Roman gods are the biggest, most well-known abusive family system there is. The only way to ever make these myths real and ground them in reality is to talk about the abuse that happens within them. Any kid from an abusive family knows what it's like to be paying a never-ending debt for being born. To be told to be grateful that you live in a constant state of fight or flight every single day. And that it can be taken away at any time. In an abusive family system, there's a lot of different roles that people kind of fall into. The golden child the mascot, the lost child, the family hero, the scapegoat, are just some of them. You can have more than one role in your family at a time. It's not permanent. It can change from person to person. You could be the scapegoat for one person and the golden child for another. I won't go into the other roles today, but I will say that there is one person and one person only in my mind that fits the golden child role in the Greek world. If you want to see a video on that, let me know. Because, yeah. (laughs) The scapegoat role in an abusive family is the one who has something different about them. Sometimes it's not identifiable. It's just something different about them from everyone else that they know and that they're related to. The one that doesn't fit in like the rest of the family does. And the rest of the family hates that they're different and sees it as some sort of a threat. So the only way that the abusive parents can handle that person being different and not being like everyone else and reminding them of how they're not exactly the nicest people a lot of the time is to unleash the worst sort of abuse on that person in an attempt to get them to change into someone they would rather have them be, into someone the parents would rather, a lot of the time, the parents would rather have them be, though it can be a sibling or another family member, extended family member as well. But of course, it all backfires because when you go through horrible abuse like that, it makes you see how dysfunctional, and for lack of a better word, the family system is. You notice things that nobody else can see because everyone else is getting things that they think that they want from this family while you are going through horrible abuse. And so you see all the problems inherent in it and how to fix it. See, the thing with scapegoats is that we actually hold a lot of power in the family system because we see those things. But we go through such horrible abuse whether it's physical, sexual, emotional, verbal, or all of the above, going through all of that abuse makes us feel like we don't have any power, makes us question ourselves and the way that we see the world so that we don't realize how powerful we actually are and realize that we have the control here. Does that sound at all familiar when you think about Percy Jackson? Percy grows up differently than a lot of the other demigods. He has a mother who 
just to start, knows that his dad is not only a great god, but also one of the most powerful ones there is. And wants to protect Percy from him and from the rest of his family. Sally learns everything she can about Greek mythology and teaches it all to Percy about how this family hurts each other, about how abusive they are. Percy is kicked out of six schools by the time he's 12 years old, doesn't have any friends of his own, because Sally wants him to be different from the rest of the Greek world. She wants him to be the scapegoat of that world. She sees what happens when you're a hero and you fit the mold and you don't fight against that system. You die. Your, your, your life is unhappy. You never feel happy and satisfied. And she wants her son to live a happy life, to be happy. Percy has a unique experience of being different in the mortal world and the Greek world because of this. He doesn't grow up at camp around kids who get that he has ADHD and dyslexia. He has to go to school where those traits make him the weird kid. He doesn't grow up around kids who understand what it's like to have a parent you've never met, but is somehow such a defining thing about you and who you are as a person and how you live your entire life. He grows up alone because Sally gave him the clearest idea of what this family is like and also loved Percy for who he is. He is always a little bit different, even beyond what being a big three kid does to you. He doesn't want chaos or glory the same way that everyone else does. He isn't desperate to make Poseidon happy the way kids who grew up being told that that is all that they should live for and that's all they should ever want by going to camp. He didn't go to camp. He has been told there are other options of how he can live his life that nobody else at camp is really necessarily exposed to in the same way. Camp is all about chaos and glory and quests. He knows that these kids deserve better and he knows that the gods can treat their own kids better. Because if Sally Jackson, who was 19 years old when she had Percy, can figure it out, a Greek god should be able to figure it out too, right? The Greek gods are constantly putting everything on Percy because they know the power he has. Not only being a forbidden big three kid who's extremely powerful in his actual powers, but because of who he is in the world. He's not supposed to exist, but too freaking bad, he does. And he's here, and now you have to deal with one of the most powerful kids knowing how abusive you are. And knowing that none of the psychological games you try to play with him are going to be effective because his mother warned him about every single one of them before you ever even met him. <laughs> Kronos could have spent 20 years stalking Percy in his dreams and he still never would have joined him because one thing a scapegoat knows intimately is that the abusers are never really held accountable not really and teaming up with the guy who made your abuse appearance so abusive is just about the stupidest thing you could ever do if you actually want to fix something as opposed to just wanting to be angry at someone. I didn't mean to. Because <laughs> nothing is ever going to be fixed by other members of the same family, especially the one that created the problems in the first place. Percy knows that the only people who would be hurt by joining Kronos are kids like him, the demigods. The gods are immortal at the end of the day. They might get hurt, they might feel embarrassed, but otherwise they would be fine. Their lives cannot end, they will continue on. Their children's do not. 
their lives would end or be absolutely destroyed for nothing that they have done. And so how is that any different than what the gods are doing right now? It's not. Change doesn't happen by killing innocent kids. It's giving kids the tools to feel like they can advocate for themselves by making small changes that will make long-term change eventually over time. But there is no quick fix. There's nothing that will be changed overnight. Percy knows that. And that is the way that intergenerational trauma is actually affected. Athena thinks what makes Percy dangerous is that he'll save his friends over the good of the mission or the glory or the class. And honestly, somebody who's trying to suck up to their abusive dad, Zeus, who thinks that you need to prove your worth every second of every day, would think caring about people is dangerous. (laughs) And to be honest, in this world, it kind of is dangerous because they don't want you to care about people. That's part of Percy's whole thing is that he doesn't make sense in the context of the world. He does things that the world is telling people they shouldn't be doing. But he does it anyway because that's who he is. And by the time the gods talk about killing Percy in the Titan's Curse, they don't, I'm not even sure they understand completely that it's too late. Percy at this point for three years has been teaching demigods that he goes to camp with that they deserve better. Do you really think that kids like Annabeth, Thalia, Grover, even little baby Nico, Charlie, all the other kids at camp, wouldn't organize a way to rain literal hellfire onto the gods if they just killed the kid that has been telling them for three years that their parents don't care about them and are abusive, if they just murdered a 14-year-old child who is the one person that's powerful enough to question what they say? You can't stop someone who is teaching people how to think differently about themselves and realize that they could live a happier, better life. You can't just kill an idea like that. It, you, it's not possible, which is why the gods never actually go through with it. The gods try to make him one of them, which is honestly a very abusive person thing to do. They don't know how to solve the problem of Percy questioning them and teaching their kids that they deserve better. And so in, the only way they can think to stop him is to make him one of them so he no longer would critique them as much if he's a god too, right? Except that Percy would never want to be a god. (laughs) Why would Percy want to be like the people who ruined him and his friends' lives? He would never say yes to that. And since this is an accurate depiction of abusive families, When Percy gets the gods to agree to be better and claim their kids and all that, they don't immediately become like amazingly better people or better parents at all. Hermes literally asks him, like, we've been like this for 3,000 years. Do you think we can change? And he's like, absolutely, yes. And they, they, they can change. The problem is that they don't want to. They fight against it, as all abusive people do. They don't want to actually respect their kids' autonomy. They don't want to actually have to be a part of their kids' life. They just want them to be at their beck and call whenever they want and not have to do anything else. Like, have you ever wondered why Hera stole Percy and Jason the way that she did? She could have easily just come to them and asked them to switch camps and help introduce the opposite camp to each other. And they wouldn't have had it be a secret. Percy could have told Annabeth that he was doing this before he went so that he didn't just disappear. She wouldn't have had to give both of them amnesia for six months and leave them so confused. It probably honestly would have been easier if she would have done it that way because they would have known the entire time what was going on and probably some of the fights that happened between the two camps might not have happened the same way if they would have had a better idea of what was happening instead of being so confused. And, you know, Camp Half-Blood wouldn't have been in, like, a state of, like, PTSD panic all those months either with when they didn't know where Percy was. But she took them because she wanted to put Percy and the demigods, but especially Percy, back in their place. Percy just told them no. Percy just gave the rest of the demigods a sense of agency 
and a sense that they had consent, that they can tell their parents no because he did it. He introduced the idea that the gods have to hold up their end of the bargain and they don't want to. So like a very abusive mother slash aunt would, she forced them to do it. She gave them amnesia, took them overnight, didn't even give them a chance to tell anybody else what they were doing to show that Percy doesn't have any power, that she can take him in his sleep and just take all the memories out of his head, except for Annabeth, (laughs) um, whenever she wants. Part of me wonders if she was surprised by how panicked the other demigods at Camp Half-Blood were when they realized that Percy was gone. Does she understand why they love Percy so much? Did she expect them all to just be fine with him just disappearing like that? The gods will never stop trying to make him give in to them. But they will also never succeed. Like a good scapegoat, Percy will spend his entire life showing that you can be an extremely powerful kid who calls out the gods to their face on a regular basis and force them to change against their entire will as beings and not only survive but build a really great support system of people to help you through this gargantuan task that has been dropped on your feet just because you happen to be born with the dad that you have. Percy can't go no contact with gods but having those who love him and willing to burn everything down to keep him safe that's a pretty good backup plan. So to sum up Percy Jackson is the best scapegoat to ever scapegoat in the most scapegoaty family of all time because he makes actual change happen and and nobody will ever change that, which is why, of course, we all love him so much.